No one ever thought going to the moon would be easy. That was the whole point of that iconic speech back in the day. Sometimes just the fact that something is hard to do is what makes it worth doing, because that sense of accomplishment when you overcome a tall obstacle can be life-changing. It can reverberate through society and inspire millions. But I think at some point, even those long-dead leaders of the 1960s assumed that going to the moon would eventually become less difficult. It might even become easy. But like any road that was paved 50 years ago and then completely forgotten about, the path to the moon has become rough yet again. The journey there remains just as hard as ever before, and it's not going well. Not at all. Honestly, it's a good thing that JFK wasn't magically resurrected last month, because he would be pretty damn disappointed at the state of NASA if he could see it today. We just heard a couple of days ago that NASA are delaying the Artemis program's return to the moon indefinitely. First, it was from 2024 to 2025, and now they're saying it will be several years before this can realistically happen. But what is the deal with that? What went wrong here? Do we need the reanimated corpse of John Kennedy to come back and whip NASA into shape? Unfortunately, it's going to take more than that to get this thing sorted out. And like any good multi-billion dollar dumpster fire, there are a bunch of layers to the whole fiasco. In a word, it's all just disappointing. So let's talk about it. This is the space race. So this was the first thing mentioned in the November 15th Inspector General's report, and it's basically the root of this whole layered onion of disaster. The timeline for the Artemis moon mission got messed around with for political gains. In March of 2019, NASA announced that they would be accelerating the time frame for the Artemis 3 landing from 2028 to 2024. Why did they do that? Well, I think it's safe to wager that they made that change because that's what then-President Trump told them to do. The year 2024 is no coincidence because Donnie thought for sure he'd be re-elected in 2020, still does, and thus he would conclude his reign over America with a triumphant return to the moon and the peasants would rejoice. It was honestly a solid plan, it just didn't work out, and pretty much everyone suffered for it. According to the most recently released timeline for Artemis as of September 2021, the plan was to launch the first uncrewed Orion flight to lunar orbit in 2021. Then 2022 is the year for stocking the moon with supplies. A series of commercial launches on powerful rockets like the Falcon Heavy will deliver science and exploration equipment to the surface. That continues through 2023 when more heavy lift rockets start delivering robotic systems like exploration rovers to the moon. And that culminates with Artemis II, a crewed flight to lunar orbit in the Orion vehicle. In 2024, the components of the Gateway Station make their way to lunar orbit on Falcon Heavy rockets. The human landing system also makes its trip to orbit around the moon at the same time. And that all leads up to the main event, the Artemis III crewed mission that lands people on the moon in 2024. According to the revised estimates that were released on the November 15th report, Artemis 1 will be pushed back to the summer of 2022, and the Inspector General finds that Artemis 2 will likely be delayed until at least mid-2024. That leads them to project that NASA will exceed its current timetable by several years. They don't put a number on that, just several, so we can assume that they think it's going to be more than just two or three years overdue. The Inspector General also forecasts the program going wildly over budget, with the total cost by fiscal year 2025 to reach a staggering $93 billion. As recently as September of 2020, NASA had forecasted the total funding required by 2025 to be just under $28 billion. If we want to get into the more tangible problems with the Artemis program, we can start with the biggest piece of hardware involved, the Space Launch System rocket, and the Orion Crew capsule. These things started development back in 2011 as NASA's next generation of heavy lift rocket and deep space exploration vehicle. 
And at the time, it was certainly an impressive concept, by far the most powerful rocket ever conceived. And even 10 years later, the only thing that would match or exceed the power of the SLS is the SpaceX Super Heavy Booster, which has been built but has not yet been flown. Not that SLS has launched yet either, it was supposed to start flying in 2017, and it would have been an impressive sight at the time, but that didn't happen, and in 2018, SpaceX completed the first Falcon Heavy demo, where we saw Elon Musk put his own sports car into orbit, and then land both rocket boosters on the ground simultaneously. It's basically the spaceflight equivalent of Big Dick Energy, and it set the high watermark for launch demonstrations that SLS couldn't even dream of coming close to. The SLS itself is kind of like a Frankenstein monster of two failed NASA programs cobbled into one thing. It's basically the same design as the Area 5 rocket from the old Constellation program. That was a scheme hatched by George W. Bush back in 2005 that was supposed to include missions to the moon and eventually reach Mars by 2030. Barack Obama axed the Constellation program when he took power in 2009, but NASA held on to some of the vehicle concepts. The SLS also shares a bunch of parts with the old space shuttle. I mean, if you look at it long enough, you notice that SLS is basically the same design as the shuttle launch system, just with the crew stage on the top instead of attached at the side, and the SLS used the same old RS-25 hydrogen engines as the shuttle, in addition to dual, side-mounted solid rocket boosters. And again, all of this stuff would have been great if it had been launched in 2017. But since that time, SpaceX have upped the game, and it's looking very likely that SpaceX will raise the bar yet again with their Starship Super Heavy launch before the SLS even gets into the air. The Inspector General identified this weakness in their report. They write on the SLS, quote, Except for the Orion capsule, its subsystems, and the supporting launch facilities, all components of SLS are expendable and single-use, unlike emerging commercial spaceflight systems. Without capturing, accurately reporting, and reducing the cost of future SLS Orion missions, the agency will face significant challenges to sustaining its Artemis program in its current configuration." End quote. So just like all rocket designs from 2011, the SLS boosters are disposable, and the inspector's report projects that this is going to cost NASA $4.1 billion for each Artemis launch from 1 through 4. The Orion capsule, like they say, is the only reusable part of the system. This is also a design left over from the old Constellation program. Orion was conceived in the year 2006 as a crew compartment for use in low Earth orbit. Orion was never designed to go to the moon. That's why it can't land on the moon. That was supposed to be done by a completely different vehicle called the Altair, but that one did not survive the cancellation. And the actual reusability of Orion is questionable because in the inspector's report they write, although Artemis 2 is scheduled to launch in late 2023, we project that it will be delayed until at least mid-2024 due to the mission's reuse of Orion components from Artemis 1. So it sounds like for that, they expect the refurbishing time from the first Orion flight in mid-2022 to last two years into 2024. For comparison, SpaceX can refurbish the Crew Dragon capsule in about four months and have flown the Endeavour capsule with human passengers twice in one year. So hardware is a major part of the equation here. SLS and Orion are so slow to progress that they've already been made obsolete twice over before they can complete one full flight. The human landing system is the other major piece of hardware that is necessary to make this whole scheme function. That is the vehicle that is going to ferry astronauts to the surface of the moon. The Orion vehicle that they ride from the Earth to lunar orbit cannot land. It was never designed to do that so they need to transfer into a separate vehicle. The Gateway Station can be cut out of the equation, and NASA have basically accepted the Gateway won't be ready for the first crewed flight, but the lander is essential. 
NASA launched an open bidding process for contractors to submit their own designs for a lunar lander, and that came down to a competition between three parties, Dynetics, Blue Origin, and SpaceX. If you want to see a full explanation on why SpaceX won this particular contract, we did make a video over on our main channel, the Tesla Space, so you can head over and check that out after. In simple terms, SpaceX won because their Starship design was over 10 times more powerful than what NASA thought they needed, and the Starship platform is actively in development right now, in real life. It actually exists. Even though the SpaceX Lunar Starship was selected with a clear advantage over its competition in every aspect, there was one individual who was not satisfied with the result and would attempt to boil the ocean in pursuit of repairing their bruised ego. That brings us to our next delay factor, Lex Luthor, or whatever his name is, Jeff, whoever. The maniacal little bald man wasn't about to go down without a fight, and even though NASA explicitly said that his blue balls lander was potentially dangerous with a propulsion system that hadn't even been invented yet, and that they didn't plan to test before putting human beings in the lander, and on top of that, a communication system that was likely to fail during the mission, leaving the crew cut off from Earth in a lander with broken engines on the surface of a dead moon, even with all of that being known, Jeff decided to fight tooth and nail for his right to kill as many astronauts as he saw fit. Which was a lot, apparently. Things got ugly. First, Jeff went to the US Government Accountability Office and complained that it was unfair to make SpaceX the winner if he didn't also get to win, even though he was asking more than twice the price for a worse product. The Accountability Office disagreed and said that NASA aren't obligated to give out participation trophies when they only have enough funding to buy one moon lander. The protest delayed the start of the work on the HLS lander from April to August, but at least they were back on track, right? No. Shortly after that, Jeff Whoever decided to sue NASA. So now on top of all the other problems that they are having, the agency has to go to court to tell a judge that they don't want to have to buy the blue balls because it's overpriced, underperforming, and potentially deadly. Either way, our good buddy Jeff continued his losing streak with yet another failure. The judge ruled with NASA, and now, after eight months of delay, work can officially begin on the moon landing system. And we single out Jeff in all of this because the folks who actually work at Blue Origin don't necessarily deserve to be lumped in with this nonsense. Many of them actually quit and went to go work with SpaceX in the wake of these protests and lawsuits. Even more Blue Origin staff wrote an open letter about how shitty they're treated by the people in charge of the company. So it's important to keep the shiny-headed egos separate from the actual smart people who are just trying to do their best in a garbage work environment. And as if this all wasn't weird enough, the spacesuits are adding even more delays to the entire Artemis mission. The recent Inspector General's report singled out the new spacesuits as a cause for delay, writing, given the time needed to develop and fully test the HLS and new spacesuits, we project NASA will exceed its current timetable for landing humans on the moon in late 2024 by several years. Again, that word several to me implies they don't expect it to be anytime soon. Just how much time are these suits taking? Well, the iconic American spacesuit design that we all know right now was designed for the space shuttle program back in the late 70s and early 80s. And nothing against that design, it's amazing that they were able to essentially build a miniature spaceship in the shape of a human body, that's dope, but like all things at NASA, it's in desperate need of an update. They've actually been working on that updated spacesuit design since 2007, but yet again, we are seeing bafflingly slow progress. The current spacesuit program, the Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Units, or XEMU, was created in 2016 and has seen over $400 million in funding so far to create one prototype suit. And it is an awesome spacesuit. The new XEMU has way more mobility than anything before. The arms are set forward in the suit to increase the astronaut's range of motion and rotation. There is a coupling at the waist that allows the astronaut to walk normally. 
there is a huge double domed helmet that has built in microphones and speakers so they can communicate without having to wear those weird headset caps. And the multi-use pack on the back allows the astronauts to clip into various kinds of equipment and vehicles. The design is there, but the functionality is just not coming together. The biggest downside is really just how far off they are in terms of budget and timeline. The Inspector General estimates that NASA will still need to spend around $600 million more to get these suits up to the level they need to be for the Artemis 3 mission when two people will actually walk on the moon. That's going to amount to spending $1 billion for two flight-ready spacesuits. The cost overrun might have something to do with the fact that there are now 27 different companies building different parts of the spacesuit, and that seems to be leading to a complete breakdown in progress. It is a bad look for NASA. It's so bad, Elon Musk subtweeted NASA and offered that SpaceX could just do it for them if need be. We don't actually know if SpaceX has an active spacesuit development program on the go, but it doesn't sound crazy to think that they could actually build a workable suit faster and cheaper than NASA at this point. So we know that the goal of landing people on the moon in 2024 is toast at this point, not happening. The most recent report that we have says 2026 at the earliest, but implies that will end up being a several years long delay in the Artemis program. And it's not just because of one thing. This program is broken on several layers. There are setbacks coming at them from all angles. Some of this could have been prevented, like not relying on decades-old hardware designs. Other things were beyond anyone's expectations, like an attack from a supervillain. But given the massive cost of this whole endeavor, and the light currently being shined on just how out of hand this has all gotten, we hope that this will be a wake-up call for NASA. They have to find a new way of operating that is reliable and transparent, and doesn't involve throwing endless streams of money away at contracts that do not deliver. Because at this point, we cannot pretend like we are not in a tortoise and the hare situation right now in this new space race. China is the tortoise and America is the sleeping hare. No matter how much of a head start NASA might have, the longer they stay complacent, the closer the tortoise gets to winning the race. But what do you guys think? Is Artemis ever going to the moon? And if it does, how long are we going to wait? Let us know in the comments section below. Please don't forget to leave an offering to the algorithm gods and give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. We've got two more videos up there on the screen that you'd probably enjoy as well. Subscribe to this channel if you're not already for more space content and ring the little bell so you don't miss out. Thanks for watching the video today and we will see you next time.